Let me call this one rod A. Let me call this one rod B. Let me call this one rod C. So in this coordinate system, I have now for A, its center of mass. You just look at the shape of things here. Hopefully you'll convince yourself its center of mass is at um, minus L over 2, minus L over 2, so that's for A. Here's the, the choice of coordinate origin um, makes it particularly nice for object B. This is, of course, at 0, 0 in that choice. And then x, y for object C. Case plus L over 2 minus L over 2. Everyone okay with that? Just figuring out where our respective three objects have their individual centers of mass. So now we've reduced this to a simple three discrete mass problem. Nice choice of coordinate origin makes the calculation relatively simple. And so just by using our expression over on the left side, what we can say now is that the position of the x center of mass. First off is the sum of the individual masses. Now I have to do my position weighting. So let's do this. So we need each individual mass times its x position. So m minus L over 2 plus 3m times 0. Again, there's the virtue of choosing that point at the center of the object. And if you quickly look at this, it's going to turn out to be the x position of the center of mass is x equals zero, okay? And once we've done this, I'll just come back and ask you if this makes sense. Same thing for y, sum of the three constituent masses. And now our position weight in y coordinate, m minus L over two plus three m times zero. Again, the advantage of choosing that. And what you get in this case is minus L over five. Okay, so um, does it make sense? Um, well, where is this? It's just below that top center of mass point on B, and it's L over 5 below that point. Okay, so roughly speaking, the center of mass of this object is somewhere there. Does it make sense? Hopefully, yes. And this is where symmetry considerations should kick in as soon as you've done a couple of these problems, and you'll be able to sort of figure out where you expect it to be. Um, so, quick summary of how we did this, and we'll be doing this quite often. You'll be looking at continuous objects, continuous mass distributions, more often than not using symmetry considerations to simply identify where the center of mass of that continuous object is. And then if it's a complicated shape like this, breaking it down into different segments, which you know are uniform, finding the individual center of mass points, and then going back to the discrete weighting <coughs> to get the actual positions. Yeah? How would we find out the center of mass for a single non-symmetrical object like the planet? Okay. So how would we find it for a non-symmetrical object? Let's say, where do we have our expression? X center of mass equals 1 over m cis times x dm. So the assumption here is that you'll be told something about how the mass distribution looks. And so you're going to need to kind of um, integrate this in terms of a common variable here single variable. So um, how might this look? Let's say in the x direction we have a density which is dn over dx. Okay? So local density is the amount of mass located at a certain x position. This is just a one-dimensional problem for now, but of course you can do it in two or three dimensions. So this is the local density. In the case of this is a uniform density, we're simply saying that this is equal to the total mass over the total volume. Okay? But what this allows us to do is say, let me get rid of this for a moment, it simply allows me to say that dm is rho times dx. 
Now, what I'm probably going to do here in the case of whatever this mass distribution looks like is I'm going to put this up here. So this is now x times rho e hex. And the question is, what does this look like now? Okay. So um, in the case that it's uniform, again, we just know that this is a number, but there may be cases where this has an explicit x dependence. So maybe it's something like rho is some constant times x squared. Okay, this would be a slightly weird object, but why not? It's something that has a density that goes as the square of the distance from maybe, some, let's say, one end of this object. And so all I would do in this case is I'd be given the expression for how this um, varies with x. And I'd need, in this case, to plug it in here. So my integral becomes more interesting, and of course the calculation becomes more interesting. So what you'll always be doing is making use of some definition of the density. In this case, it's a one-dimensional density. Obviously, in the case of 2 and 3D, it's different. But this is the density. You're going to recast your small mass element in terms of the position. And the thing that's going to vary is this. Okay, So this is where it allows you to put in non-constant density calculations. Plug it in whatever form you're given. And then it's simply a question of solving the integral in here. Now, I don't want to say I'm not going to give you problems of that type. I would like you to be able to do some of them. Um, I probably won't give you one on the homework, but what I would like you to do is take a look at a more complicated shape that still has constant density. And so what I've put in my notes is an example that's fairly complicated, and I'm just going to ask you to look at it and work through it. Just so you know what this is going to look like, it is an object which is kind of um, semi-circular, I don't even know what shape this thing has, what the name is, it's a kind of semi-circular slab, and it's got a certain radius, but it's constant density, so a radius something like this, and the calculation that I put in my notes is a calculation of finding where is the center of mass of that object, okay? Now it is still constant density, but what's a little bit more interesting about this is how do you actually do the integration find out where the center of mass is. So I'm going to ask you to read that. Um, again, it's unlikely. I'll test you on something as um, mathematically sort of slightly involved as this, but it'll give you a good sense of how that density calculation and then the integral with appropriate limits is done. Questions? Yeah? So um, how does like the change of like the center of mass relate to the motion of like, the system in general. I appreciate sure, like, one okay. question that relates to that. So how does the motion of the center of mass can relate like the change to? of the center of mass, like let's say the center of mass changes in like a system, and then how does that relate to the motion of the system in general? So if the center of mass changes in a system, how does it relate to the motion? Um, okay, so let's explore that a little bit. Um, when you say, if the center of mass changes, um, do you mean that, um, are you looking at cases where the center of mass of some system maybe is moving at a certain speed, or are you like more thinking like of questions or scenarios where the, the configuration <coughs> of objects themselves kind of changes within that system? I guess the configuration. Okay. So then, um, most of you will have taken a look at the homework if you haven't already done it. There's a problem on there that involves um, kind of elbow-shaped object, which has two rods and then there's a mass on the end. And so it asks you to figure out the center of mass position in two configurations, where the rod is indeed L-shaped, elbow-shaped. And then though the language is a little bit confusing on that question, it also asks you to say what happens if you take one part of that elbow, straighten the thing out, and ask where the center of mass is in that case. So I had some interesting discussions about this um, in Office Hour. Um, if, if there's an internal reconfiguration of masses in some system, then presumably there's some forces at work, right? And so 
I think the only thing I can generically say there is um, there's no there's no sort of set thing to do there. There's no generic um, rule that's applying. It's simply the implication is that somebody has come in, applied some forces, reconfigured the objects, and you simply have to recalculate where the center of mass is in that case. You have no way of knowing without any more information about how it's moving. But and I'll come back to your follow-on question. Um, I sort of feel that underlying your question is also the suggestion that you've got some system that has some center of mass and some external forces are acting on that system. Well, it simply means that the center of mass of that system acts as though the entire mass of that system were at that point, and it's going to respond in the way that you expect it would respond, just based on, based on the net external force acting on it. But there may be, and this is why we're going to turn our attention to um, more interesting motions of extended objects in a moment, it's possible that um, for extended objects, then something else is happening to that object. And in particular, when we talk about rotations, that's going to be an interesting case. But I don't think I've answered your question yet, so that's a I was thinking more, if, if you want to relate to like the homework questions, the problem with like the woman standing on top of a canoe, ah, and okay. the woman moves, and it asks, like, what's the motion of the canoe? Okay, so question coming back to this person walking along the, the canoe, floating canoe. Um, so, let me um, just set that up again quickly. Remember, there's a person standing in a canoe, the canoe's on some lake surface, um, and we talked at the introduction about the net external forces acting on that object. So there's gravity acting on the two of them, and there's what might be classified as normal forces acting on the two objects. The one of them is actually a buoyant force. But if there's no net external force acting on that two object system, regardless of um, what sort of internal action, reaction, force pairs are at work in that system, and we can talk about those. What you expect is that the center of mass position of that system does not change, because there's no net external force acting on it. So, let me just quickly throw this, because I know this is a conceptually confusing problem. Canoe, person at this end, this is before, and after. So this person starts walking in this direction. Um, and so, kind of draw this a bit over here. Okay, um, so some of you know this from first hand experience, but just thinking through it in terms of forces acting on this. If this person walks from left to right on here, what you expect is going to be the response of the canoe. Moves to the left. Okay. Why does it move to the left? Right in the back. Okay. Um, so kind of the punchline. So um, there's no net external force acting on this thing, so the center of mass cannot move. But before that, why, why is it that the canoe itself is moving? I mean, if it moves, there must be some force acting on it. Uh, yeah. Right. So there's an action-reaction force pair at work here. So as this person walks, this is how you walk, there's friction between the soles of your feet or the soles of your shoes on the ground. That's, so you don't need to clap when you're walking. Um, uh, so there's an action-reaction force, right? So that's what allows you to go forward. If you're on something that has a finite mass and is free to move, if it experiences a force that direction, it's going to accelerate. Now, of course, when you do it on the Earth, the Earth is massive enough that you don't notice that, but it's there. But if you're on something that's relatively light and able to move, then the reaction force pushes the canoe in the opposite direction. So yes, so there's a force that makes this thing go this way as you're walking and you're exerting a force from the soles of your feet. So that's why it moves. Um, but yes, aside from the internal forces, those action-reaction internal forces in that exchange, there's no net external force in this system. 
And if there's no net external force on this system, its center of mass cannot move. There's nothing that will make that thing accelerate. So, okay. Um, so how do you actually set this up? Well, you want to look at this from the perspective of somebody from the outside in an external inertial reference frame. Somebody who's looking at this, and the way that I suggested doing this to a few of you yesterday, was simply choose a reference point which is fixed with respect to the outside world. Not fixed to the canoe, because that's going to mean you have to worry about relative kind of displacement. So let's choose this as my reference point. How do I figure out the center of mass of this object? Well, I have a certain mass here at this point. So its center of mass is here. And I have the center of mass of this canoe assumed uniform in this problem in some way. So its center of mass is here. And I simply figure out the position weighted mass by our expression here. Figure out the center of mass. So that part is straightforward. The question is, how does this work here? So I'm still figuring out the position of the center of mass with respect to this reference point. So this person has moved a certain distance. Turns out in this problem, we know it. We also know the length of this thing. So we can figure out where the position of this is. We can figure out where the position of this is, but not yet, because we need to recognize that the whole thing has moved to the left. So this thing has moved to the left by a certain distance, maybe D. And so I have to make sure I'm describing, <coughs> excuse me, I have to make sure I'm describing the position of this point and this point correctly in this outside reference frame. So if this thing has moved to distance D, okay, I probably should put some variables on here to make it slightly clear what I'm talking about. This whole thing was a length L in this problem. Um, so if this has moved to distance D, well, first off, the center of mass for this thing is L over 2 away. It's still L over 2 away from this point, but now this point has moved the distance D in this direction. And then again, we would know where this person is relative to the boat, so we can define everything um, in this coordinate system. I know this was not the easiest thing to follow quickly, but all I want to do here is make sure that I'm first off recognizing that the center of mass in this case won't move because there's no external force. I have to calculate it from the perspective of somebody outside, or at least that's the easiest way to do it. And I have to recognize that um, there are relative displacements in here. In particular, the displacements of these people, this person in the center of uh, the mass of the boat here, have to be offset by the amount that the boat has moved when I do the calculation. Okay? But you should now be able to do the calculation using exactly this again and state that they're equal. The positions of the center of mass have not changed. I'm not sure if that was helpful. These are the sorts of things that are not particularly well done quickly on a chalkboard, but hopefully that's sort of addressing it. Yeah? Uh, what if the person on the canoe stands on the absolute edge and it tips over, <laughs> That's but, okay. but there's still no uh, net force. So we'll okay. the center of mass still be So um, you're starting to look in slightly more interesting problems, and you're starting to, okay, tips over. Um, but not fall. Yeah, okay. So we're starting to look at situations that have more interesting physics going into it. And in fact, it's a good segue into us starting to worry about rotational motions. Why? Because that can be in some sense treated as um, force acting on the boat here. Here's the center of mass of the boat. There's a force acting on this boat when this person's right at the end of this. This is that person's weight, presumably. And it will, if you think about it, we haven't talked about this yet, that's a really bad pun because we're about to talk about torque, T-O-R-T-U-E. This is a turning effect. It's going to tend to make this thing turn, which is again a good segue into what we're about to start learning about. All right, other questions on this? Yeah. Um, so again, if you are dealing with situations where there's no net external force acting, you can assume um, that the 
the momentum of the center of mass is conserved. So the total mass times the velocity of the center of mass, that doesn't change. So this is cases where we've got things in motion. Um, and so um, I don't know what, how more I can specify this. It simply means that um, you can, I guess in a sense you can figure out the um, momentum of each of the objects and then simply combine them together and say that the overall momentum of that weighted center of mass just stays doing what it was doing before. Um, yeah, so it, it's really just to say again, there's no net external force, there's no change in the motion of the center of mass, and if it happens to be moving already, it's going to continue moving the same way it was. Okay. I sense that could probably do with a little bit more elucidation. Um, I think the way I'm going to handle that is maybe as in recitation next week for the TAs to go through maybe a problem actually to do with momentum um, in center of mass systems. Um, and then I'll probably select one or two problems on this upcoming week's problem set that are probing that a little bit more. All right, let's turn our attention to rotations. Okay, so I'm going to spend the next week-ish talking about rotations. So we're starting to talk about objects that have real physical extent. And um, I'm just noticing that um, our demonstration technician set something up that I didn't request, which I should probably talk about, which is this. Um, we're going to talk about objects that are rotating in some way. So um, what does it mean? We have some object that is able to spin, rotate about some axis, is a perfectly nice example of it, of a stationary, in the sense of its center or its axle, stationary bicycle wheel. So it's spinning about an axis that happens to be pointing out from my chest towards you. So obvious example of rotation, we want to start exploring the kinematics of this motion, saying something about how each part of this bicycle wheel is moving. Um, and then eventually we'll talk about the forces. But another set of motions that will turn out to be very interesting and important is the combination of a rotation and a translation. So a good example of a combination of a rotation and a translation. What we call a rolling motion. So there's a rotation of this bicycle wheel as a whole, but there's also motion of its central rotation axis, okay? So there's rotation plus translation. So not surprisingly, the first case is simpler, simple spinning, rotating, the second case will require a little bit more complicated analysis, but there are many, many physical systems um, that rotate, so I'm going to explore this. Okay, just as I saw this, let me just come back and um, talk about it. So, kind of slightly contrived setup here, but it's a pretty heavy steel hammer, um, which has been tied to a thin flat ruler, and you mostly can't see this, but there's no actual connection between the hammer here and um, the bench. So in that sense, it's sort of freely suspended by these two cable ties. Um, it's going to require some knowledge of rotational dynamics and torques, which we'll introduce next week. But what you see here is a case, a um, little surprising perhaps, where it's perfectly possible to suspend this massive hammer by placing the center of mass of this system under this point, okay? So again, there's a lot going on here, um, which we don't fully have the tools to analyze yet. But what you might um, expect is that if I move this thing so that the center of mass of this thing falls not under this point where there's kind of, um, in a sense, there's a force here that's keeping it in place, what you might expect is eventually this thing is going to fall off. And indeed it will. So. Okay, so let's come back and talk about rotational um, variables. 
So we're going to go right back to scratch and start talking about um, displacements, velocities, and accelerations. So first thing we need to do is define a coordinate system. perspective diagram, let's say this thing is actually horizontal, but it's going to be free to spin around this axis. So the immediate question we're faced with is how do we define the actual angular position of this object at any given time? So no big surprise, what we're going to do is simply define a reference line on this thing, maybe it's this, and we're going to define its position with respect to some coordinate um, choice. So this might be a particular line that we choose. And then if this thing rotates by a certain amount, of course it's rotating through an angle. Let's call it theta. So um, since I have this, why not try? Here's some random shaped two-dimensional object. has a bunch of lines on it, which is possibly slightly confusing. But I can simply imagine spinning this about a vertical axis. I don't have an easy way to pin this on something right now, but I can spin it about a vertical axis, and I can define its particular angular displacement by a reference line on this object compared to some external world reference line. So that angle definition is going to be theta. So theta in this case is the angular, let me call it the angular position. With respect to some coordinate axis. Axis is really not a good choice here because axis also implies spin direction or axis of rotation. So let me just call this with respect to some selected um, coordinate direction. Okay, easy enough. Now, of course, if this thing turns, it's going to turn through a certain angle. So I can talk about a change in angle as an angular displacement. So this is simply, let's say, theta 2 minus theta 1, or theta final minus theta initial. That's an angular displacement, OK? Pretty straightforward. Um, units, a um, couple of options, at least. Um, in terms of angles, possibly most familiar with degrees. Um, we'll use radians quite often. Right, that's fine. Um, so units, degrees, or radians. I'll maybe talk a little bit more about the definition of this in just a moment. But those are going to be our two common units for defining angular positions and angular displacements. OK, so fairly straightforward. Um, we're going to choose by convention <coughs> displacements that are counterclockwise from our perspective to be positive. Just a convention, so the common convention. Positive implies counterclockwise from our perspective. So we're looking at our two dimensional perspective here, do it like this. Um, so from your perspective, counterclockwise means this is rotating in that direction. Okay? 
to keep that in mind. And it's definitely perspective dependent. From my perspective is it's clockwise, from your perspective it's counterclockwise. So the direction we're looking is going to be important. All right, so let's talk a little bit about um, the relationships between uh, angular displacements and subtended arcs. I've mentioned this already when we talked about circular motion. 